Bible says in verse 4, an evildoer gives heed to false lips. A liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. Boy, that's enough. I can just preach on that the whole morning. <laughs> we'll just go right there. Uh, you know, I think, you know, it's so amazing how the Bible fits up with where we are right now. You know, we've been reading in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and you would think the prophet that is speaking in Isaiah and Jeremiah is speaking to the world today. Because they're the same. There are many people that would rather hear a lie than the truth. And many people who just love to get involved when they hear somebody talking spitefully about somebody. You know, if, 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 I think one of the worst, the hardest things to do as a Christian is when you know something about somebody, which the, you know, the best thing is not to know as much. <laughs> Come on, isn't it better not to know? You don't have to know everything. The least you know, the less you're responsible for. Come on. So it's better not to uh, try to do all you can to get to know. You know, when people put things, sometimes people will go on Facebook and they'll put, ugh. You know why they do that? Why do they do that? They want everybody to ask them what's wrong. Uh-huh, they want everybody to say, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? They want, they want a thousand people to say what's wrong. That's why they do those kind of things. Come on, so, so be wise. I don't ever answer those kind of things. I don't, I don't talk to those people about their problems because that's why they put it on there. I figure if anybody wants my help, they know where I am. Otherwise, I'm not their source. <laughs> Come on. But it's important that we understand that when people start getting in, you know, I, I, what I was going to say a few minutes ago, is sometimes when I know, I do know something about somebody, you know, you heard something, and it's got to be the truth if you heard it, right? Especially on Facebook, right? No. It's got to be the truth. <laughs> and if, I, if I'm not careful, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm, God's taken me a long way from that, thank the Lord. Now praise God for deliverance over that kind of mess. But I know what it's like to hear something about somebody that makes you aggravated at them. Well, they're so mean, mean, mean. And then somebody walks up to you and has the audacity to tell you how wonderful that person is. And you're standing there listening to them and you're going, uh. Because <laughs> you can't hardly stand it. You just got to tell them what it was you knew about that person to kind of bring them down a little bit. You don't want to brag down too much, you know. That's kind of, that's a worldly attitude. That's a worldly attitude. I thank God that he's delivered me. And I thank the Lord I don't hear as much junk as he used to hear either. Because when you get set free from gossip, you don't hear much gossip. It's just the way it is. To, it, you just don't hear it. People get to where they don't talk to you because you're not interested. And they need interested people to put that poison into them. So the scripture says here that um, an evildoer gives heed to false lips. How many of you know that every time you turn on your television, no matter what you're listening to, you're listening to lies after lies after lies after lies? Come on. Just a blank lie. I'm not talking about just uh, an, 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 this is my opinion, this is your opinion. That's open for discussion. But people lie about hard facts. Come on. People lie about hard facts to you on the news these days. Hard facts. You know, used to, when I was a child, you listened to those people on the news. They just told you the news. Oh, for those days again. Yeah. But you can't hardly find that on the news anywhere. So they, they've all taken sides and they have an agenda. Almost all news broadcasts have an agenda. And that agenda is to tell you what they want you to believe. And so we have to be careful. Because the Bible says an evil person enjoys being fed lies, technically. A person enjoy. tell me what I want to hear or I'm not gonna listen to you anymore. Come on, y'all know what I'm saying. So, um, I could give you an illustration, I don't know if I should or not, but right now there's being said, I will, on the news it's being said that, that three and a half years ago, the inflation rate was 9%. It was 1.4%. It was not 9%. Three and a half years ago, inflation was 1.4%. But they're speaking this out constantly. 
when I took office, when I blah, blah, when this happened three and a half years ago, inflation rate was 9%. That is a, that's not just an opinion lie. That is a blatant lie about facts. But there are people that want to hear lies. And there's sure a lot of people want to tell lies. And I'm not just talking about politics, I'm talking about in friendships. There's people sometimes we don't like very much and people we do like a lot and we want to hear bad things about the people we don't like, we want to hear good things about the people we do like. We get all this going in our spirit. If we're not careful, we get caught up in stuff. Let me just tell you something. It's so much better, as I said at the beginning, not to know so much. Come on, I'm not talking about not being aware of what's going on in the world. We need to be aware of the events going on in the world because we're fixing to vote in November. And we've got to vote godly ways, the best of our ability. So we need to know what's going on in the world, but we don't need to be blinded by those people who want to tell lies and tell us things we want to hear. Get to the truth. Stand for the truth. And then it says, a liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. Just going around listening to everybody talking, hoping that I can find somebody to pick up a little, little seed of, of spite so that I can spread. A spiteful tongue is never telling the whole truth. Let me say that again. A spiteful tongue is never telling the whole truth. Quite often there's a seed of truth in it. But you know how it is with a lie? If you put a little drop of a lie into a whole gallon of truth, the whole thing then becomes a lie. Yeah. They have a motive. They talk in you and put in a little bit of, lie, of a lie to turn you to their way of thinking. But we need to understand, that's like listening to people that are preaching the gospel. We need to be careful because a little drop of false doctrine ruins the whole, the whole thing. I was reading a book, I told, the book I told you about, Jerry. The first two or three chapters, I was so excited. Oh man, it's a message of grace and it's so powerful and it's so good. Well, the other night I woke up in the middle of the night and I couldn't go back to sleep and I went in to start the next chapter. It all went south from there. So therefore, the book, I cannot recommend to anybody to use it. Now, wonderful things happened in the beginning that were so exciting. The truth of the gospel was being preached so boldly. But then this chapter just totally did away because of false doctrine that was put in, in by the author. We need to be careful. That's why the Bible teaches us to guard our hearts. Guard our hearts. So important that we understand that. We are responsible to do that. That's not something that God's going to just do for you without your permission. You have to ask the Lord, give me revelation of truth and help me to see a lie when I see it. Help me to be aware of a lie when I see it. Because Bible, the Bible is contrarily opposed to all lying. You know, even a lie that is twisted with the truth a little bit. You know, we can give somebody a, the truth with a little look on our face that the face makes it a lie. We need to be totally honest at all costs. You might lose a friend. You might lose a friend if you're totally honest. But we're still required to be honest. Not me. Some, some people think if you disagree with them that you're, you're just mean and, you know, you're, you're this. They call you names if you disagree. Y'all figure that out? People call you names if you just disagree with them. You're not allowed to disagree in America anymore. You can't, you can't disagree with the running theory that's being taught. And if you disagree, then you're named. You, you get named. Tag some kind of a name. But you know what? We've got to take the chance. And we've got to be tagged with whatever needs to be tagged, if that's needed, to stand for the truth. Verse number five. He who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. He who is glad of calamity 
will not go unpunished. Wow. Man, these things in Proverbs, they get you, don't they? Have you ever almost wanted to say good when somebody got what they deserved? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I want you to know that I have escaped what I deserved. <laughs> By the goodness of God, God has been so much, so much better to me than I could ever have deserved. God is good God. He's a loving God. And he forgives iniquities. But we should never get joy or pleasure out of someone else's demise or someone else's uh, hardships. We should always be ready to rejoice with those who rejoice, as it says uh, in one of the writings of Paul. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's what we're called to do as Christians. Doesn't mean we get down and have a pity party with people. But there are viable reasons that we need to weep, especially when we're praying for those people. I know people that you could say deserve whatever they have to get, you know, and I pray. God, whatever it takes to bring those people to Christ, I want you to bring them to you. But you know what? If trouble comes and heartaches, man, that is not going to make me, me happy because those are people I love. Those are people I love. I don't want to see them go through horrible things before they come to Christ. My will is that they come to Jesus because he loves them and because he draws them. That, that's what I want. But God knows. But if they had to go through something to get to Christ, I'm not going to rejoice and say, well, you got what you asked for. Never. And God help us to understand we can't do that for people that we don't love either. No, there's some people we don't love. Right now, it makes me upset when people make fun of President Biden. I'm talking about concerning dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever it is. That is not funny. That is not funny. If you've ever lived around it or known somebody who dealt with it, it's an absolute horrible thing for somebody to have to go through Alzheimer's or, or dementia. It's not fun. It should never be made fun of. Never. I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. Sitting around so many times, news reporters sitting around waiting on somebody to stumble somewhere or another, waiting on somebody to, so they can make fun of them and act like that's the way they are, or they're stupid, or they're this, that, or the other. These things are things that should not be going on, but they sure should not be going on in us. Our hearts should not be that way. We should be, we should be sad to see anyone going through t terrible physical situations, mental situations that they, you know, people didn't ask for that. They, you can't, it's not something you choose to be sick. It's not something you choose to be demented. It's not something you choose. And therefore we should never mock or make fun or laugh about things that somebody absolutely cannot help, did not call upon themselves, and they're, they're you know, going through these things. Should never make fun. It is not funny. So we're not to mock that. And we're not to mock the poor, it says. I can't imagine any of you mocking the poor. I don't believe any of you get pleasure in making fun of people that are poor. But there are some societies that do that. You know, there was a preacher I know years ago in town. There was one of the pastors who said, if you live in a trailer house, don't come to this church. Or if you drive a jalopy, don't park it in this parking lot. Because we don't want anybody to look at this church and think we're anything. You know, they, this is one of those name it and claim it churches. And everybody's supposed to be rich that goes to that church because we've all claimed it to be rich. So therefore, if you've got old jalopy sitting in the church, that's contrary to what we preach. So don't do that. That's being reproachful toward the poor. You know what Jesus said about the poor? He said, you're going to have them with you always. <coughs> That's what Jesus said. Jesus said that the poor are going to be with you always. And that's something. <coughs> so therefore, there's always going to be poor. It's a hard thing for us sometimes to know who's poor or who's just a, just a scam artist. 
we got a lot of that kind of stuff we have to deal with. We used to, I remember years ago when I was a child, we had what was called hobos. Y'all remember what I'm talking about? And uh, you know, I've seen my mama so many times, they'd come asking for something at the front door. And mom would say, well, sit down here on the steps and I'll bring you a plate of food. And she'd go in the kitchen and fix a plate of food and take it out. The man would sit on the front steps and eat a meal. He probably, they said, put an X on her house and said, you can get a meal here. I don't know. I really don't care. But I remember the generosity of my mother's spirit. That no matter that these people were, were looked haggard and dirty and all those things when they came to the door, in mom's heart she knew that they definitely had to have food regardless. So she, I never saw her turn one away. Back then, that's what they wanted. They were glad to get food. Now, don't offer them food because that's not what they want. <laughs> yeah, but they want some money <laughs> to go and get some drugs. And, you know, I've been guilty of giving that away sometimes just on the spur of the moment. But we need to be sincere about it and seek God and be led by the Spirit and not just by what somebody necessarily. It doesn't mean you've got to open your purse to everybody that asks for your money. Um, you, need, you need to be wise. Um, and, and seek the face of God, but never to be reproachful in our attitude. Drug addicts are, we don't reproach them either. They are bound. They are bound. Drugs are so strong, so powerful. You can't make fun of people that are bound by drugs. We need to be praying, if we know them, that they'll be set free. A liar listens, and he said, no, here we are. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. In verse number six, children's children are the crown of old men. <laughs> and the glory of children is their father. Wow. I was making that comment about uh, young walking J.C. Uh, she sent me a picture of young walking J.C. down the ocean in Florida this last week. And I said, he is smitten. <laughs> and he is. That little girl has him wrapped all around her little finger. But you know what? That little girl loves him. And she trusts him. It's, a, it's so wonderful when your children have children. And when, especially, when you have the opportunity to Help them to know the fullness of God. And that's where Jerry and Young are right now. And just that's why they do what they do. That's why they do what they do. Is to plant that good seed in JC's little heart. And I pray for her every day that God will just get her so deep into Jesus that she will always long to serve and love him. And and you have you have all of you sitting here, most of you have either children or grandchildren. And it is true, you know, there's nothing like, how many, how many remember your first grandchild's birth, birth when they were born into this world? <laughs> wow, isn't that something? Nothing, nothing in the world like it, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what they're going through. Uh, I'm telling you right now, uh, it, it is an amazing experience to put that little grandbaby in your hands and to watch them start their little process. Families, are the heart of God. He created families first. He created families before the church. Families are important to God, and we in America have a tendency to not be as respectful of and as, and as concerned and knitted together as families as we used to be. In these days, uh, this second part of this verse reminds me that in these days, young people have a tendency not to honor and respect the elderly. You go to the nursing home, you know how many people you'll see there that never see their families. Never see their families. And by and large, so many children, young children as they grow up and become young families, they leave their parents and they have no respect for the elderly. In Japan, I know, if I'm not mistaken, and the culture is still the way that it is, and they're not Christian nation, but they honor the old people. 
doesn't matter who the old people are. They consider them to be the high mark of society is the old people. And the Bible teaches that. When it talks about the hoary head, it's talking about Brother Donald, <laughs> Sister Beverly. <laughs> it's, see, you notice I didn't name me. The, <laughs> when it talks about the hoary head, it's talking about the great headed people, the old people. That's who it's talking about. And it's talking about honoring them and receiving wisdom from them. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every old person in America has got wisdom. Some of them don't have a dab of wisdom. But just because there are some who don't doesn't mean that you discount the whole culture of elderly people. If time goes on, you'll be there, believe it or not. <laughs> I thought it would take a lot. I thought it'd take a lot longer to get here than, than it did. How about y'all? <laughs> All of a sudden, you know, you think, good gracious. You know, you feel the same inside, but you know you're not because you, your strength is not what it used to be, you know. I see a kid go jump over something, and I go, oh, how nice it would be. <laughs> but it is important to understand that we should honor the elderly and respect the elderly. And sometimes, you know, we need to go even to parents and grandparents to find wisdom instead of running to your peers. I would certainly give it a run. I would certainly give it a run. If I wanted to know how to raise children, you know what I'd do? I'd go to someone who's been successful. And I would say, you raised your children, they're serving the Lord, how did you do that? Instead of talking to your peers, who are in the same basket you're in, you have no clue what you're, they're doing any more than you do. Because I'm gonna tell you something about raising kids. You don't learn until you get through. <laughs> when you get through, you go, oh me, <laughs> let me have another chance, Lord. <laughs> you know, we all get into raising children just because you decide to have a baby. Let's have a baby. Okay. Oh, it ain't a baby. It's a life. <laughs> and the more babies, the more lives you got to deal with. <laughs> it's a great joy, but it's also a great responsibility. And there are people who have done a good job of raising children, probably by accident, by trial and error, but at least they know and it's so much better to receive, to receive instruction from those who have walked down a path before you rather than just trying to make you a new path. God may have made a path through them that you could follow that would make your life a way easier than just, than just making a decision. I know I'm talking to quite a few of you that are in my range here, but there are a few of you who are younger. So just think about that when you're trying to decide on some things. Not that young people certainly don't have the ability to make good choices. They can and they do. And so I'm not putting that down at all. But, but you know, the Bible says the multitude of counselors. So sometimes you can go to somebody who will help you avoid a, a, a roadblock or help you avoid something that you wish you had never had to go through. If you just talk, sit down and talk. You know, sit down and talk to somebody like Young who's raised, and he raised children. Not, not that all of them have been successful, but he's been a good father and, and been there for his children all the time, always. And uh, so talk to other people who have, who have done, you see their children, they're doing well. And especially those who, who have children that are serving the Lord. What did you do right about that child that caused them to make a decision to serve the Lord? Because that's all that matters. I want my children serving the Lord. Come on, that's all that matters. I don't care if they never get a college degree. Of course, my children are grown. But... I don't care about college degrees. I don't care about this person's an engineer, that person's this, that person's that. I don't care. I don't care a bit, not at this age in my life. I care that people are serving the Lord. And then all the other things that God blesses their life with, praise God. But the Bible says that's where you're supposed to put your eyes. Not on getting well, but on getting Jesus. That's what matters the most. If you live this whole life and gain the whole world, the Bible says. If you live this life and gain the whole world, but you lose your soul, but you lose your soul, all that you gained in this life will be worth nothing. Will be worth nothing. All that matters 
You know, when we raised our two girls, I will say, they knew that God came first in church, at home, in the restaurant, in the grocery store. Wherever we went, God was first. We made a lot of mistakes. We were pretty stupid about a lot of things, but that never wavered. Like Jerry and Kathy both told us. We knew that you weren't the way you were because you were a pastor. That you would have been the same if you'd have been pumping gas at a gas station. Our home would have been read the same, would have been ran the same. Because we, in our lives, committed our lives to Jesus Christ and let nothing interfere with that. So therefore, those girls grew up knowing that's all that mattered. And they were able to get past our stupidities. And we had plenty of them. Because that was the ship they were sailing in. And I'm so thankful today. Terry knows. He was there. <laughs> he was there during all those years. <laughs> okay. Then it says in verse number six. Children's children. Oh, I got that already. Verse number seven. Excellent speech is not becoming to a fool. Much less lying lips to a prince. You know what that means? It means somebody who's a fool who's trying to talk like they're smart is stupid. That's what, that's what that means. So excellent speech to a person who doesn't have any sense, who is really a fool, is just a bunch of baloney. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's hard to cover up stupidity. And you can try your best to make everybody be convinced you're really brilliant when you're really not smart at all. I have a feeling most people realize that something's going wrong there. <laughs> it's not really hitting the, the bell that hits the ringer because it's not coming through well. So for a person, you know, I, I've always believed that we need to do our best to let God use us as, as ourselves and not try to try to expound eloquently when we're not eloquent. I don't want to be another thing to stand in the pulpit and use words and gestures and other things and then talk to you in, in your living room and, and talk like a country hick. Come on, if I'm a country hick, that's the way I talk. Let me just talk that way when I'm talking, even in the pulpit. Come on, not to put on airs. That's what this is talking about. Well, you know, you know my old saying, be who you is, cause when you be who you ain't, then you ain't who you is. Think about it. When uh, Joseph told his father to go before Pharaoh, he was going before the king of the land, this guy from the backwoods, who were just shepherds, nobody important as far as Egypt was concerned. And here is, they're having to go before Pharaoh and present themselves as Joseph's father and brothers. You know what, Joseph's advice to his father is good advice across the board. Be yourself. That's what he said. When you walk in there before Pharaoh, be yourself. Don't try to act like you're some hot shot. Don't try to act like you're some great person. And technically, Joseph's father was a great person in the eyes of God. He was a great leader. But you know what? In the eyes of Pharaoh, he wasn't anything. And so for him to go in there and try to act like he was equal and a big shot to Pharaoh would have just totally destroyed the conversation. And when they went in, and Pharaoh said, what do you do? He said, we're shepherds. We're shepherds. A lowly profession, but unashamed. What does it matter? What does it matter if you work at, at McDonald's? Who cares? What does it make you? Does it make you? There's nothing wrong, by the way, of working at McDonald's. If you do it well. If you do it well. Whatever we do, we do it with all of our might of the Lord, and then we're not ashamed. You don't have to brag and say, you know, well, I'm in, I'm in management. <laughs> in managing hamburgers and french fries. <laughs> but just be yourself and be honest. And if people, if people have a problem receiving you as 
uh, what, whatever you are, you're not talking about being, uh, I'm all that and I'm important. No, we're not supposed to be that either. But when you present yourself exactly who you are, if there's somebody who doesn't like you the way you are, you don't need to be close to them anyway. Because if people are gonna turn on you and not be a friend to you because of the way you are, then, then just because you put on a show is not going to convince them any differently. So presenting ourselves uh, as servants of the Lord. Then, uh, let me see here where we are. Uh, verse number eight. I should have studied, Carolyn. <laughs> a present, <laughs> thank the Lord for his help. He says, be instant in season and out of season. So I give him all the glory to do whatever he wants to do. Verse eight, a present is a precious stone in the eyes of its possessor. Where, wherever he turns, he prospers. A gift is a precious stone in the eyes of the beholder and you'll prosper. You know, you know, um, a person who appreciates and, you know, pastors talk a lot about gratitude, being thankful, and showing thankfulness. Uh, I gave the illustration Wednesday night of the other day, my husband, my husband is always being a very thankful person. And the other day, I generally get him coffee in the morning. So I had fixed him a cup of coffee and brought it. Well, he has a recliner. There's a table right there by it. He is in the bathroom with the big, our big door closed between the bathroom and the living room. And I walked over and set the coffee cup down on the table by his chair. And he said, thank you. He heard the coffee go on the table. <laughs> to appreciate the gifts, the greatest gift is Jesus, of course. And we should every day appreciate that. But we should also Appreciate, respect, and honor things that other people give us and do for us as well. A precious thing. You know, there have been things given to you and to me that we didn't necessarily um, need. Maybe it was a dust collector <laughs> or whatever it may have been, something. But you know what? It was something that they thought of you and thought they, they loved you. This is an, a gift is an expression of love. And so within reason, I understand your house can get loaded up with dolphins. <laughs> Just don't tell anybody you like a certain thing. Like chicken, I like chickens, they'll give you chicken every holiday. Don't, don't tell them you like a certain thing or you'll be overloaded with it. But that's, a, that's an expression of love too, you know? They think they have found something you will enjoy and they give it to you. But, but greater than that is a gift of just daily honoring and respecting others and appreciating the fact that someone cares enough. You know, my husband's so appreciative that sometimes I don't respond well enough because I just, you kind of take it for granted. He appreciates everything so much you kind of look over the appreciation after a while. But, what I'm trying to say is that we need to be mindful. People don't have to choose to do nice things for us, even your family. And don't just go along as if that's expected. Well, they should have done that. I, I, they, you know, they're my wife, they're my husband, that's my kid, they ought to just go do whatever. You'll get a lot more out of life, you'll prosper more. On your job, in your house, raising your children, you'll prosper more if you will express appreciation. Sometimes we appreciate in our heart and in our mind, but it never comes out our lips. That's where I used to be. I just thought, well, they know. They know. No, they don't. No, they don't. And someone does something for you. Be sure you verbally express appreciation. All of us, I need to do it better too. I haven't gotten there yet all the way. I need to be there. More verbal. I'm not as verbal as, believe it or not, y'all think I am, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not as verbal as a lot of people. So it's a battle for me. 
it's a battle for me sometimes to say thank you. I appreciate that. That was a good job. You did great. Oh, well, you know, come on. We need to be more mindful. I need to be more mindful to appreciate the good things that come into our lives because everything that people give you that they don't have to, it's time, if it's good encouragement, if it's words, if it's a gift, they didn't have to give it. They didn't have to give it. So God help us to be more thankful for all the wonderful things God has done for us. Amen? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I'm going to stop right there. It's time to quit, I think. And uh, let's just get ready to really get into worship. Praise the Lord, because he's worthy more than anybody. To be thankful to God for the wonderful things he has done is way, way beyond anything else we can do for anyone else. Give him glory and honor this morning in the house of the Lord. I love you. God bless you. And have a great service today. Mm -hmm.